Well, hello, Viva Albertos. Jason Hill here, along with our VEB Riders crew. Today, we have a very special episode. The historians over at VivaAlbertos.com are telling us that this is the 20th uh, anniversary of the site. And so all year long, starting here in spring training, all the way through the end of the season, we will have alumni writers and friends of the site joining us. And we will be talking about the 2024 Cardinals, giving opinions and concepts and ideas about them, while also reminiscing and uh, telling jokes and having fun uh, talking about the history of the site and, and all of the fun things that go along with that. So today, and I'll start in order of seniority, we have Alex Crisofuli joining us. Hey, Alex, how's it going, man? Hi, John. How are you doing? Good. And John LaRue as well, JL. Uh, also, at one point in time, RC, uh, I'm just going to call you all three. Is that OK? Sure is it is. cool? I just started off by calling you the wrong name, Jason. I, I apologize. <laughs> yeah, you're getting ahead of me. That's OK, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, how's it going? Yeah, glad to be here. Good, good. And our writing team today, we've got Heather, site manager. How's it going, Heather? Oh, you know, this is a blast. I'm very excited. <laughs> yeah, this is right up your alley, isn't it? This kind of fun yes, stuff. Yes, this is the kind of stuff I live for. So <laughs> Yeah. And two of our older writers, not in age, although Mike and, and I can both claim the age part of it, uh, but in terms of uh, longevity at the site, Gabe and Mike Jones. How are you guys doing this morning? It is morning when this will post. That's why I asked it that way. Yeah, that was absolutely, I know absolutely. it threw you all off, but this will actually post in the morning. So pretend with me. <laughs> doing great. Glad to be with you guys. Yeah. I had a bit of a cold, but I'm otherwise good. That's why I got a long sleeve shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Well, the Cardinals have started games. We're into spring training. Things are going well. They recently made a signing, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Brandon Crawford joining the team, probably because he is an older vet, and that's all the Cardinals are interested in. But we'll have all the analysis of that here in a minute. First, though, let's talk about uh, our two guests and about uh, Viva Alberto's. Uh, this is we're gonna we have several Q and A's and questions from the site that we're going to ask. And so I'm going to, I'm going to lead off with a question asked by one of our faithful readers from game seven, 2011, one of our newer uh, posters and commenters. He says, this site is growing and I'm new. Who the hell are you? And why should I care? So Alex, who the hell are you? And why should our listeners care? I am nobody and they should not care. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess more specifically, I, I wrote at Viva Alberto's from about December 2015 until July uh, 2017. And I, as I told you before we started recording, I stopped writing because my daughter, my second uh, kid was born and it just seemed like a good time to stop. But I, I was there when Craig Edwards was the site manager and Ben Godar, John Fleming, um, lots of other great writers, um, some of whom I'm forgetting right now. Heather, of course, who is kind of the uh, main staple at Viva Alberto's over all these years. So, yeah, that's me. Yeah. So what kind of things did you write? Like, what was your what, what was your specialty? Stats, music, well, um, <laughs> you know, so, like baseball cards? I, I know. I know like the word imposter syndrome gets thrown around probably a little too much on the internet these days, but I, I really felt that when I was at VEB and when I first started there, I thought like if I didn't have some crazy analytical bent to everything I wrote, then it was going to be something that the people there did not want to read. And that was never quite my specialty. Like, uh, John is great at that. John LaRue, I'm talking about, you know, so many other writers who were already there were better at that than I was. I was always more uh, student than teacher when it came to that stuff. I loved reading that stuff. It was like a whole new awakening to how to see the game. But I wasn't as good of a teacher when it came to that stuff. But I still felt like I had to kind of wear that hat. And it wasn't until I would say, I don't know, a couple months in where I, it just dawned on me like, just write about this stuff that you're interested in. And there's a good chance that other people uh, at VEB, the readers, you know, the people, the commenters will be interested in that too. And so, you know, I started writing things like I, I did a, a post one time of just a bunch of screenshots of people behind at opposing ballparks. <laughs> 
of Albert Pujols' big home runs and just like their <laughs> their crushed faces and stuff. And I was like analyzing everyone in the crowd and how angry they looked or how sad they looked. And as stupid as that sounds, like that was the stuff I was probably best at. And I remember after writing that post, someone sent me a really sweet email that said something to the effect of, you know, I was having an awful day and I still am having an awful day, but this like made me laugh. So thank you for writing it. And that like made me feel really good. I felt, you know, uh, so I, I think I kind of geared more into that lane a little bit uh, after I was at VEB. And um, that's pretty much, I would say, where where I sort of remained. As I saw you posted by Mark McGuire, um, I, I was at the game in 1988, 1998 when he hit the... Uh, home run off the post dispatch sign, which, which they then memorialized with that band aid for the rest yeah. of the season. And <laughs> seconds after he hit that home run and you all probably remember how it was back in the day before stat cast and stuff like that, they flashed on the scoreboard. That ball went 545 feet. And we were like, Whoa, really? That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, we didn't care that I, I have no idea how they figured that out. Blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, fast forward to whenever I wrote that, probably 2016 or 2017, uh, you know, people dug into that home run and found out it probably didn't go that far. And um, but that was kind of the stuff I enjoyed, you know, thinking about, you, you know, writing about. And so, that, so that's kind of what I did. Yeah. I still reject the idea that, that that ball only went like 450 feet. Isn't that what they settled on? I think they said 487, which oh, is 487. still a very okay. That, yeah. now that, so that's was still a very impressive. Home that's run. pretty yeah. good. Yeah. 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 You kind of it took it takes a while. The rest of you writers can weigh on on this, but it there is sort of a a cultural expectation of like stats and and analytics and stat nerddom. But then like <laughs> Once you get your legs under you as a writer, like the community is very interested in what I call trash articles. Not that your stuff was <laughs> trash. I write the same thing, but you know, John, I know you've got some of those too. I just wrote a piece on, on Cardinals players as D and D characters. So, I mean, you dig into that stuff and you, you create real uh, icons in, in VEB history. We got some questions about those things here coming up, but. But uh, John, so you you on the other hand though really did take the analytics to heart and and your your pictographic infographic stuff was just I still as a graphic designer in my spare time I'm still just amazed by that. In fact, I'd like to talk to you about coming back and helping me re uh, redo my my payroll stuff. So John, tell us about what you did, man. Yeah, so um, I, it's I don't know anything. I just I know graphic design. I'm an art director, so I could do pretty graphs. Um, and that makes people think I know, uh, think I know more than I actually do. Um, and that was kind of the niche that I tried to find where it's like, okay, well I can, you know, let's bust out this line graph that, you know, this will, or uh, scatter plot, people love scatter plots. We'll just kind of, <laughs> um, but it was generally where I tried to go or just trying to stay abreast of things like I me, mean, you know, like Craig Edwards and Ben Clemens, who was here, you know, uh, moved on to like fan graphs and just staying abreast of things that those sites were up to and trying to translate them as much as I could. Um, I think once it got to, they were starting to talk about things like uh, vertical approach angle. And that's when I said, okay, I think I'm probably, this is becoming a young person's game. I'm out. Uh, but there was also this like, <clears throat> and Alex, I know you tapped into it and the bends are always amazing at it. Um, Gadar and Humphrey in this case, but uh tapping into that that rich vein of nostalgia you know i'm sitting here looking at like the baby blue jersey and it's like you can never go wrong you will always find your dorky gen x nostalgia if you go that route um so i try to tap into that from time to time too and it's just a great franchise for that kind of thing anyway because i mean even the 60s and the god awful 70s and the bumpy 90s with mcguire and all that i mean there was there's no shortage of that kind of thing so yeah all right, well, let's pull the rest of the writing team here. We'll just kind of have some open conversation. The Cardinals uh, brought in this week Brandon Crawford and what seemed like a response to the situation with Tommy Edmond and his injury. And so, uh, Mike Skyrick, we'll just start with you, our transaction guru. Not a whole lot of transaction that went along with this. The Cardinals signed him. Do you got any news and information about that? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, re I remember... Um, when Gabe and I were talking about the um, the composition of the bench last time, and I said, you know, that we were talking about Jose for me, and I think he, you know, 
correctly countered me and then saying that, you know, Jose for me isn't really a shortstop. And so now, you know, now it looks like what I, what I wonder is if, the, if, if this is the, um, you know, the move that's actually going to put somebody like Burleson to the bench. Cause you know, you have, I mean, Herrera's there and you got Carpenter and um, uh, now Crawford. So I guess the question is, no, maybe there'll be room for both, you know, for Burleson anyway, if Edmund has to open the season on the injured list, you know, then you're looking at uh, Dylan Carlson in center field. So I guess I don't know, but I think eventually, you know, the, I think it's, you know, Crawford was, I think a lot of this depends on how you feel about what you like in your bench. Do you like, you know, younger guys who don't have anything left to prove in AAA or do you want to give them a shot or do you prefer, you know, in a pinch hitting situation, somebody who's been around a long time is maybe more equipped to come in off the bench cold without, you know, having to do a whole lot, even during the week. Um, you know, for me, it's about ability, but for, for bench spots, um, I, you know, I tend to prefer the guys who have been around a little bit longer. I think that they're a little better equipped to handle that kind of assignment. Um, you know, Crawford, doesn't have the power that he once did, but, you know, Crawford is a really interesting player. He came up as he was drafted, you know, he was more known for his glove and the, 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 the serious question for a long time was, was he going to be able to hit in the major leagues? Um, but then he, you know, he made all kinds of adjustments and he turned into one of the most reliable regulars in the majors for a good 10 year period. Um, you know, you know, like he hasn't struggled as badly as Carpenter, in the you know in the last season or so he's not the wizard with the glove that he once was but you know, I, I think he can I think he can really help you I think it it can steady the bench a little bit um, kind of like the, you know the problem is the bench being so small with all the pitchers you've got that you can't have everything anymore you don't have the Whitey Herzog seven man bench where you can have you know everything you want um, I, I I think we're missing right now a little right handed hitting power. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I'm in favor of the signing, getting somebody who, you know, especially in the late innings, coming up against a, you know, a, a top setup man or a closer who you might want to be able to get in there to pinch hit uh, for Mason Wynn. I, I, I mean, I'm, I like the signing. Um, you know, I don't. Or Earl Weaver once said that, you know, the most important decision he made all spring was who the 25th man in the roster was going to be. You know, and I, I mean, that may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but, you know, the bench is those, those kind of things where you can you can really help yourself and squeeze out a few extra wins sometimes. Yeah. Gabe, you got a take on Crawford? It's it's fine. It's probably necessary. I don't know if we could have done any better because you we can't guarantee anybody playing time. And also it's more of a failure of our system, I guess, to not have another shortstop just ready to step in if, if things go wrong. But like, uh, if you look at his numbers last year, his ex Woba was pretty much the same as in 2022 when he was a two plus WAR player and less than 500 plate appearances, I believe. So maybe there's a little more upside than we're imagining. But you know, it's unexciting. But we do need somebody at short if Edmonds is going to Edmund is going to start the season on the IL, and also if they want him to focus on center field. Yeah, you know, Crawford is an interesting case on how strongly you believe in a stat, one of the newer stats like OAA, outs above average, versus, I would say, I don't really mean it this way, the more traditional stat cast defensive metrics, DRS and UZR. DRS, uh, Crawford last year, minus 14 at shortstop, terrible. UZR, minus uh, 4.9, also terrible, but in OAA, a plus six shortstop, which is well above average. Me personally, I default to OAA now. I like it. I like it better as a system, but it's really hard to ignore those numbers. Um, and so, I guess their Cardinals must see it the way that OAA does. And hopefully, he can still be a defensive player. Who knows how well of a bat he can be? John, I'll jump to you. Find yours. You were a king of finding that little analytical nugget that like made a signing interesting or or really like hit on what was actually happening i i don't know if you've even had a chance to dig in or not I, surely you haven't written an article about it uh but what's your take on on crawford uh for me it's two things and actually like you talking about the oaa thing what i'd love to see is is it how does that break down going right or left 
Um, because obviously to your right, you've got Nolan Arenado. I mean, that can cover a lot of mistakes. So if that's, um, if part of his defensive shortcoming is going to the right, then that's not necessarily a concern. Um, for me, it was more just the red flag of, um, it's a big red flag about Tommy Edmond. You know, I mean, it's weirdly, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Brandon Crawford is a perfectly fine 25th guy on your roster. Um, I, I think the other thing from a front office standpoint, it feels like they're like, it seems like the theme of the year really is just let's lock in that floor. Like let's not have the bottom fall out. So if Edmund's going to be out for any extended period of time, or if Mason Wynn has trouble adjusting, you've got a perfectly cromulent option in Brandon Crawford who can uh, be an everyday guy if you have to. Um, it's the same with Lynn and Gibson and some of the other things. They, they really aren't taking a lot of risk. Um, but there's also not maybe as much upside as you might think, but yeah, um, that's mostly for me, it was the red flag with Edmund. Like I didn't, I don't think I realized it was that they were that worried about it. They felt they needed to sign somebody like Brandon Crawford instead of just taking a flyer on the remains of the, of the world. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like they're trying to make sure that they don't have Taylor Motter playing shortstop again this year. At least it's a guy yeah. who's played there defensively. So exactly. Alex, I want to turn to you a little bit. Um, so much leadership talk this off season, which I'm sure you've caught. I'm sure that that has been, you know, part of what you've picked up on from Carpenter coming in to provide leadership, Lance Lynn to provide leadership, Kyle Gibson to provide leadership, Sonny Gray to provide pitching and leadership. You know, um, here we got, you know, Crawford coming in, another veteran signing. Do you feel like, and not just about Crawford, just about the whole thing, this whole approach to leadership, one, do you buy it? And do you think that it can have any positive impact or is it just the Cardinals going for proven production at a cheap price? Well, I, I don't think the idea of bringing in veterans who are respected across MLB for like this under the banner of leadership is, is necessarily trivial at all. Um, that said, and let me be clear, this is totally unfair to Brandon Crawford. Um, and I don't even think it's a very good comparison, but for some reason, the first thing, or one of the first things I thought of when this was announced was Mark Ellis in 2014 Yeah, and how I kept wanting to see Colton Wong out there and how frustrated, how frustrated I was getting with Matheny because it just seemed like I'd turn on my television and see a Mark Ellis who had like a 35 WRC plus and was clearly completely washed. Meanwhile, we had this younger guy who, you know, we all kind of wanted to see out there. And something tells me if I go back and look at, I, I think that was the 2014 season. If I, if I go back and look that Mark Ellis probably really did not play all that much. I'd be surprised if he even, you know, top 300 plate appearances, but in, in my head, he played, he had like 600, you know, I just felt like I was <laughs> always seeing him. So yeah, I, I don't hate the idea of Brandon, of the Brandon Crawford signing at all. And I, I agree with what almost everyone else has, has said. Uh, if he can, you know, be a mentor to Mason Lynn, I think that's, that's great. If, you know, even with already having Matt Carpenter on the team, if somehow having that other, another lefty on the bench is somehow going to prove to valuable at, some point in the season that would not surprise me um it and i'm not the first one to make this point i i'm trying to remember where i first heard someone make this joke but it is rather at wayne Wright retired uh, correct me if i'm wrong but i think he was the oldest player in mlb last year i i might be i might be wrong in that but adam adam wainwright retires and the team somehow got older yeah <laughs> yeah by the way, uh, Mark Ellis did have 650 plate appearances. No, it did feel like it though. It was 202, <laughs> 202 plate appearances in 70. Fewer than I thought, which is a lot. It's a lot. What honestly. was his? Do you have it in front of you? What his slash line was? I remember. Uh, do you, do we dare do it? I mean, like this is going to be. <laughs> I've got it. Yeah. I've ever said. Uh, it was one like eight, LOL WTF. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 180 batting average, 213 slugging percentage. Um, he did have a 6.9 walk rate. Uh, you were pretty close. You're 30 WRC plus. I think you had him at 35. So 45 so just, starts at second base, one at first base. Oh, really? 40 only 45 starts. I thought it would have been more than yes. that, but hey, same. You know, he absolutely got released in the middle of the season. So he did. He, for when he was playing, he probably actually did get 600 per whatever. Yeah. He was basically an everyday player at a really terrible one there for two or three months and then 
and then and then Wong is was Wong. So, but also Matheny. So yeah. <laughs> so in light of that, do we trust Marmal more than we trusted Matheny? I mean, you know, this is a veteran thing, but Crawford doesn't have the same kind of Cardinals history that you know maybe some others have. I mean, this is Wayne's job, right? Like like Crawford isn't here to try to push it and take it, right? Anyone can answer. You know, I feel like Mike Matheny is a pretty low bar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and especially the further we, the further away we get from that, it's like, you know, you, you really kind of realize how bad you had it. But um, I, I trust Ollie to, to do better with that. I mean, it, honestly, I think, and I know there's a question coming up possibly about managers and what they do. And I think that's kind of a lot of that is baked in now, you know, I mean, I think that um, every manager has a big, book full of data that they can use and rifle through things. And they realize that maybe starting Brandon Crawford or the Mark Ellis of the world, not to say that Brandon Crawford is Mark Ellis, but the, the, starting the Mark Ellis of the world every day is probably not the way to go just because you don't like a young player the way they carry themselves or something. So I also think he was pretty restrained in how often he played Albert Pools and it'll be way easier to not play Brandon Crawford than it was to not play Albert Pools. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I was really, I was honestly super worried about that going into the season. I, I mean, I was seriously predicting that he was going to start every day of the whole season and it was, but it, it, I was wrong. I have to admit. Yeah. Yeah. And even when he did play uh, quite often against lefties early or uh, sorry, against righties early in the season. And I've argued several times that he shouldn't be. If, if Marmol was seeing what Pujols did later in the season in batting practice and with um, Albert, the pitch, the hitting coach at that time, then you can't hardly blame him for putting Pujols out there as much as he did. They they got that situation right. And so that has built a little bit of trust in my mind for Marmol in situations uh, like this one. So, well, as far as the rest of the spring, we've got a, you know, a week or so of games and, and, and competition and things happening down there. Um, I, I just want to kind of get a general reaction. And Heather, I'll start with you because we haven't heard from you yet. Um, what has stood out to you? What have you been seeing, watching, if, if you've even been able to? I know I haven't been able to watch much with work and everything. So what does your spring uh, you know, diet uh, look like so far? The teacher called on me for the, <laughs> the yeah, question sorry. I didn't know the answer It was your to. turn. <laughs> I haven't, um, I haven't watched any spring training yet. Uh, and I guess I think this is the right way to use the term irony, but an ironic part of like trying to manage a site about baseball is that you don't get to like actually have a lot of time to, um, look into actual baseball (laughs) Uh, (laughs) so i've been you know with the we had this whole recap research and everything that's been taking up a lot of my time and i haven't been able to watch any baseball for spring training so i didn't even know edmund was hurt until they signed brandon crawford and i was like oh shoot that happened okay (laughs) let me read what blake said so i can see how i feel about this (laughs) yeah right right um hasn't there been only one game on tv that yeah. might be a part of it too. Yeah, I think. at least on Bally. There's been some that have been broadcast from other, you know, I like, yeah, I barely got to watch any of the first game itself. So, yeah, I know that Bally has cut back their, we could talk about this if we wanted to, cut back their spring broadcast schedule. I'm sure it has something to do with the fact that they're going bankrupt. But I was going to ask, I was like, I don't really know if I know where to watch the baseball games <laughs> right now. <laughs> the uniforms, guys. Yeah. 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 That's we need big... to talk about, I mean, this is the kind of crew with John and Alex that we might have yeah. to spend a full hour on the uniforms. Like, do you guys have an opinion so far? <laughs> what's wait, someone, what's with the uniforms? Oh, this is important to me. <laughs> oh, wow. Take it away, guys. <laughs> yeah. So was it last week? Was, yeah, I think was, so. was that two weeks ago? Last week, two weeks ago. It, it was kind of the main discourse in the, I guess, baseball world. Uh, fanatics slash nike i'm not even nike has a contract as i understand fanatics actually manufactures the uniforms do i have this correct yeah yeah and they released what and someone correct me if i'm wrong because heather like you i am not a big spring train spring training person either um but they released these new uniforms and it's my understanding that we're not just looking at the spring training uniforms we're looking at the uniforms correct right and the lettering on the back, meaning where it would say when, if it was Mason Wynn or Wainwright or whatever, it is 
in the type of font and it's so small, it looks like the type of uniform you would buy at like a like a knockoff uniform you would buy at like a gas station or, or something to that effect. And there was also this about two days later, this other controversy erupted because all the players were getting their spring training pictures taken. And it looked as though the <laughs> pants were so poor quality, you could see through them. I now, did see that. That, that, sort of, <laughs> that somehow that crossed of, my radar. <laughs> yeah, that, that got there. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I think that's sort of been debunked. Um, and somebody correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, that it has more to do with like, you know, those just heavy duty cameras they're taking, they're using on picture day. I don't know. And that if you look at previous seasons in which they're getting their pictures taken, you can also see the jersey through their pants. Now, other players, though, are saying like, no, these pants are terrible. Uh, <laughs> there's something noticeably different about both the appearance and the fabric of these pants. Uh I personally could not love this more. I I want I I want to see them out there in the worst possible like cheapest <laughs> uniforms. Just the absurdity. Put of, them in shorts. Yeah, the high the the, the the one of the richest sports leagues in the world is going cheap on uniforms. That's a, it's it's so absurd. I I think it's a great story. It's so baseball. Hey, Leonardo, it's like so your... baseball. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead, John. You're John as a font guy. I know you're a font guy. We could talk fonts for hours. Yeah. Uh, as a font guy, as a Jersey guy, uh, lay it, lay it on them. Let, let, let's hear it. Let's just hear the rant. Uh, okay. So probably the best way I could, the best you, you asked about like your Alex, you were talking about the, the, the size and how much it went down the best way I could to, to put it in the parlance. It went from like an 18 point font across the back to like a 14. So not tiny, but considerably smaller there's also something with the arch i think for me it was more just the genitals that were showing up with the pants oh, um no. <laughs> that that was the the big one I was like, what's going on here uh <laughs> but it was also awkward because the, the day they released it so many players are complaining about it, including like miles michaelis is one of the first ones but then nike has this press release from Nolan Arenado and some other people <laughs> talking about how much they loved them. And it was, I don't know. I've definitely in, enjoyed the chaos. For sure. <laughs> Blink the twice other... if you are being forced to say this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the interesting thing is you guys were talking about the font and I, I, somebody may have caught this tweet. I could have the team wrong, but I want to say it's the Royals where they actually, or the Mariners, one of the two is, is they act that, lower font didn't apply to them because they asked for it not to. So they asked for that aspect of their Jersey, not to be tampered with, so to speak. And the request was honored. So then now the questioning about all these people with these really nice, you know, embroidered emblems and things like that. Well, why didn't they ask? And, you know, I know the Cardinals again, and my apologies, this is what I do for a living. So, but I know the Cardinals specifically asked for certain things that they wanted to hold on to. That was not one of them, but it was, I think there was something to do with the chain stitching around um, the, the actual, like the birds and the bat. Um, so they accommodated that, but um, beyond that, I mean, there's still the tiny names and everything else. I'm trying to find pictures of this. I do, I do remember the pants thing showing up like in my Facebook feed on like a, you know, like a memes page or something or, or like a news thing, um, which <laughs> I, but I don't remember the font, <laughs> yeah, but the it's... pants have always been like fairly thin. I thought because they always, there's like these long, like shorts, like sliding shorts and stuff under there that you could always, you could always kind of see those through there so <laughs> if they chose to wear them sometimes they don't and that's part of the problem i think yeah i guess so. <laughs> there was um, i guess if, so you want to see the font that there have been a lot of side-by-side -side comparisons um i think later was like one of jp crawford where you could really and the mariners again i'm so sorry for this this is what i do for a living but the, i love it the mariners like especially have this like multi-layered thing where there's the the color of the name and then there's an outline and then there's another outline and stuff like that has gotten way less defined um than it used to be so again this is you know it where it comes into to play those stuff like accessibility where people maybe can't read it as well or you know yeah. uh, so and it looks worse it looks even <laughs> 
So what I'm hearing from you guys is that at this point in spring training, we really don't care about what's happening on the field and jerseys are way more interesting. Like, I mean, has anything of any significance besides Edmonds apparent continuation of his recovery from, from surgery, nothing else has happened of significance, right? I mean, it's just, they're hitting their pitching. The stats don't really matter at this point. Has anyone seen anything that gives them either, either excitement or cause for concern so far? Um, Neither excitement nor cause for concern. I just thought it was interesting. I thought I read today that the Cardinals have yet to hit a home run. I would believe that. I, and I don't think that is like means we are going to have a horrible offense or something to that effect. It's just I think I read something like 250 plate appearances so far this season without a home run. Is that right? Yeah. Dang, it's been that That's many sure. <laughs> I kind of want to suck in spring training. We we had the best record last year. I'm I'm thinking good things if we were terrible. Yeah, that's exactly why you don't have to watch spring training. We were good <laughs> in spring training last year. We are the only club with no homers so far. <laughs> no, no, no. There's a couple. <laughs> wait a minute. You know, we are the only club with no homers. Even the Astros have one, and everyone else has at least two. It's all I know is it's the time of spring where I turn on the games, and if you don't catch the first handful of innings. You know, like, who the hell is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, some of the lineups I've seen so far, even catching the first inning, it's been a little bit like, uh, I don't know. I'm not so sure. If I, don't, if I don't even know who the guy is, then really, you know, probably not worth watching. Well, they have a lot of guys in those games, too, who are not even on this. We're not even really invited to camp. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they'll have people that are just on, you know, the, the minor league spring training roster get in there. So, you know, it's it's easy to not know who anyone is. Yeah. Jupiter residents who won a contest or something. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 All right. Well, let's jump down to our, some of our questions. I, I'm going to give our community a lot of credit here. They they always show up for these Q and A's with uh, our podcasts and our guests and, and they, they overwhelm us on a, on a, you know, every time we do this, there's more questions than we can get to. That will probably be the case here today. We've, we've set aside a whole half an hour and you guys know that we rarely stay under an hour anyway, but we're going to try today and we're going to try to get as many as possible. And the way that I've got this divided up, there's, there's thankfully, this is a Cardinals community and, and many of you asked actual Cardinals related questions. A few of you think that we're just here for your personal entertainment. And so you've got a lot of cultural and fun little questions that uh, you want our our guys to ask uh, and answer here today. So um, should we start with a fun one of some kind? We just got into the, the Cardinals talk a little bit. So let's do this one. There's one here that I wanted to get to. Um, well, let's start. This one's not super fun. It'll be a good kick it off, though, from from DB Dub, who, by the way, our local site historian, he's the one that that informed us that we are at 20 years. And so. Thank you, DB Dub, for your contributions and for your uh, for your fan posts and things like that, man. Keep rocking it. Here's what he says. He says, how is writing for VEB different now as opposed to back in the day? A different balance between analytics or narrative story writing, different levels of coordination between writers. And so I thought maybe, you know, one of our, our older school guys, maybe Alex, since you're the you're the oldest uh, in terms of tenure. Uh, could kind of talk about that. And then Heather, why don't you perhaps, perhaps age as well? But, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably older than you, uh, Alex. I would guess so. Well, I think Heather does. He I know Heather predates me because she was there when I, when I started and she was there when I left. Um, yeah. But that's a good question. I've almost always likened VEB to kind of like Saturday night live in that there's these different eras and some people say it was, the best when it was these people or it's the best now or whatever. Um, to me, it's always been different over the years, but consistently good. Uh, I don't have a great answer in terms of how the sites change from 2011 to what it looks like now, um, because those changes are so subtle over time as different writers come and go. Uh, but, and I think this is what made writing there kind of intimidating at times is that 
had and still has such a great reputation, you 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 just didn't want to come in and mess that up. You didn't want to write something that was going to be like, <laughs> this is completely inaccurate. Um, you know, you've made five factual errors that anyone should know. And um, this is beneath what we expect to read at VEB. Um, so I don't have a great answer for that question other than to say like, yeah, it kind of ebbs and flows, but it's it's always been very consistently good. And I think that's why it's, um, I mean, probably the most well-known Cardinals blog. I mean, I'm sure it is, but also one of the most well-known team baseball blogs, I think on the, on the internet. Mm -hmm. Heather, how have things changed? And I mean, you've been here this whole time. Now, now you run the site instead of just writing, you know, like how, how was your, not just as a, as a site manager, but how have things changed as far as the way the site operates and what you see there? Uh, I think <laughs> we used to be a lot sillier, <laughs> <laughs> um, which some people, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. You know, so it depends on what you like, I guess. Um, there used to be uh, a lot more like memes and in, in, in jokes, I think we still have that, but, and that, I think we have a good blend. Um, but, uh, there used to be, you know, uh, I think Dan Moore used to be really, really good about this, where he would do his like almost fan fiction sort of stuff. Um, and but it like kind of like what I do, but way, way better than anything I could ever do. <laughs> um, his characterization of the, the players <laughs> is, is just so good. Um, so it, there's things like that. I think we're a little bit more analytical now. I think um, with stats being more uh, available, um, I think that lends itself like that's just a natural progression of things. And people are more interested in that now than maybe they were even 10, 10 years ago when I first started writing. <laughs> um, uh, gosh, I, I think that's the biggest the biggest thing. Other than that, I don't know. I feel like we, you know, we talk about the Cardinals. The Cardinals are different too. So I think that also lends, you know, you have to change with what you cover. So, um, but they're, they're also still very the same. I think Viva Alberto's is kind of like that as well. <laughs> yeah. 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 Probably totally different writing and talking about the Cardinals back in like, well, were we even around? And yeah, I guess we would have been that first year, 2004, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a different, a different time, a different era, a different style, um, probably was a happier writing environment than 2023, for example. Yeah. 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 And I, it's, it's nice. It's, um, I guess bittersweet, maybe I can't think of the word I'm trying to think of, but because I think we do have, uh, maybe a larger audience now. I like, we talked a little bit about Harrison Bader actually seeing something you wrote yeah. where maybe before that might not have ever happened. So there's a freedom in that, that we don't necessarily have now, but it's also cool to know that like the person you wrote about could see what you wrote about. That's, that's a cool and terrifying thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's jump to a, a Cardinals question here from a uh, bed uh, ask this one, uh, are there any contracts and, and John, I'll start with this one. We'll go John and, and, and Skyrick on this one. Uh, any contracts that free agents signed this off season that you wish the Cardinals had beat to sign, to give a player beat to sign a given to sign a given player. Sorry. I can't read it. It's all, it's up on the other screen. So you get the idea. Answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Just make up the question and answer it. <laughs> yeah. I have a nagging suspicion that I, my answer I think a lot of folks, it's going to drive with a lot of folks where you have Lennon Gibson, and I think that's kind of duplicative, yeah. um, where especially after, you know, all the talk about wanting to bring more swing and miss into your staff, which they did. I think they did a wonderful job in the bullpen, but maybe somebody, a second starter with a little bit more swing and miss might have been helpful, even if it meant fewer innings. So uh, for me, you know, Ken Tomato was right there. Uh Imanaga signed a really good deal with the Cubs. I mean, I think either one of those two granted four year outlay for Imanaga, but it's not like, you know, the Cardinals have plans for four years from now, but um, the rotation, there's nobody booked for four years from now. So it's not really a problem. Um, those are the two that I think really were, you know, you didn't need Lynn and Gibson take one or the other and then go for one of those other guys. Yeah. We talked about it in the last episode a little bit that they kind of jumped the market in one sense thinking that 
things were going to get moved quickly. And then, and then if they would have just waited and been patient, there would have been several interesting options late in the off season that they could, they could still jump on them if they wanted to, but yeah, I was with you in Monaga was my answer. Mike, you got anyone different? I can't remember what you answered last time. Um, well, I said my favorite transaction of the off season last time was uh, hiring Kyan Bloom. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> because I was, you know, I was just really intrigued by having somebody that had, you know, a lot of experience in another organization that had been successful to see how, you know, those ideas might be able to, you know, help us in some areas where we've been lacking recently. Um, but as far as, um, you know, I, as uh, player acquisitions, I, I agree. I agree with John. I would have liked to have seen them it, try to re-sign Montgomery if they could. Um, I don't know if we'd have been able to meet the price of the years, but it just didn't really seem like there was a whole lot of interest there from us. I would have liked to have seen that and maybe even Hicks. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree um, that didn't need both Gibson and Lynn. And so I, I would have used one of those maybe other pitchers to do something there. Um, you know, other than that, um, I, I can't really think of anybody I would have, I mean, given our, I mean, you can always have those dream deals, right. But given what we're, what we know about what kind of deals the Cardinals do and don't do, um, you know, you know, you wonder if, if, if it would have been nice maybe to sign, if we're going to sign an eight year deal, for somebody, it, it would have been kind of cool to have, you know, it, or maybe not even eight years, but to, to have that kind of money to set, to set aside for like one of those pitchers. But instead, we felt like we really had to get Contreras at that. So that's something I look at. Good. Well, OK, I got a fun question for us. There's several of these that I want to get to, and they're all sort of uh, Viva Alberto's related um and involve viva alberto sort of memes and themes and so this one comes from card fan uh cards card fans jc i'm not exactly sure how he wants that said so uh here's the question the mission if you choose to accept it is to extract the red baron that is a Schaefer for those of you that don't know a former beloved uh prospect writer on the site uh extract the red baron from an arctic prison which Cardinals, current or past, would you assemble as the extraction team? And I'm just going to open that up. So you got to have, let's say, a let's say a five member team. It needs to be a diverse team of skill sets. So I want to hear uh, the Cardinals that you would choose to go and rescue the Red Baron from an Arctic prison from a Russian prison. It's got to be a Russian. Surely the problem with the Red Baron is that he's in some Russian prison somewhere, <laughs> right? That's why we we don't know where he's gone. So so yeah, throw out anyone just jump in here. Who, who's your first? Who's your first pick? I will say one of the first things I was tasked with doing in my uh, site managerial career was tracking down the Red Baron's whereabouts. And I, I don't know exactly where he is, but I do know. Well, I I, I did find out he got <laughs> he had some sort of traffic violation in the St. Louis area. <laughs> so he's fine. <laughs> He he did disappear, but he is as far as far as uh, his his traffic report goes. Unless someone is impersonating him and stole his car, which we can't rule out, um, he is at least okay in that regard. <laughs> Although needs to has a ticket he has to pay. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as extracting him from this uh, Arctic prison, uh, I was reading through some people's responses uh, in the comments, but I feel like mine. You got to go with Jose Okendo. A secret weapon oh right? yeah if you take it literally yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> good all right jump in there if, uh alex go ahead if it's going to be a five-man team then i am going to send our five starters from the 2023 team because if we happen to lose them on the mission as well do we really care <laughs> <laughs> cannon fodder is what you're going for there right correct <laughs> All right, who else you got? Another 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 Cardinal to include on the team. I was running with Aaron Miles just because he's basically indestructible. You couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> no matter how hard they tried, he just kept coming back. Plus, you know he's already <laughs> taken down a robber. Like he's already got the experience, right? I mean <laughs> That's great. Uh -oh. I mean Tommy Pham, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's why, though, yeah, give, give, give our listeners that don't know, give give the why there for why it has to be Tommy Pham. 
Well, he has experience being stabbed. Uh, that's, three that's times? Is he up to three times now? He's at least stabbed twice. three times? I think at least twice. At least twice. I think it might you be. You know, three. if the first time I get stabbed, shame on you. The second time you <laughs> get stabbed. Second time. Right? Shame did they, did on me. <laughs> <laughs> did he was stabbed by either his father or stepfather though? So I'm not. I'm gonna leave him off the hook on that one. That that was, yeah. <laughs> but he's doing good now. He's still in the major league. He's got Domestic, a nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Scar, you got anybody else? Oh, you, you know, I mean, it was. It, it's interesting if you if you think about that, like all time indestructible team. You know, you'd think about guys like Shane Robinson, who I think went oh, ten yeah. minor league spring training invites for like thirty seven years. Yeah. Um, you know, the people that keep coming back, like, you know, we could have Aaron Miles, we could have Sugar Shane Robinson, we could have uh Pete Cosma, who was another like 20 year minor league spring training guy. Oh, wow. so, you know, oh, those, you have like the never say die. That's what you kind of see. That's the thing about it. Like <clears throat> remote part of Alaska, you can be super strong, but you gotta have like the will to continue and the endurance. So the I'm with you guys win. on those. I'm with yeah. you. I'm, I'm going Danny to my, go ahead, Alex. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, for uh, listening to Mike made me think of Danny Cox, who was a legendary tough guy from those late yeah. 80s teams. I think he, similar to Tommy Pham, also had a some sort of domestic dispute with maybe his father in law or, or, or his someone that he uh, took it care of. It was the brother in law. Like, brother-in-law okay there it is yeah you saying yeah. danny cox like i can't believe i didn't think of it before but uh world war ii veteran daniel descalso <laughs> <laughs> right he's perfect for it <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> that's an old that's a deep cut and i don't that think that's a, a bb one it's just a, a fritz a fr alex fritz um <laughs> the defunct uh st louis sports sb nation blog Curious case of Daniel Descalso. Yeah. Well, I've got to go. Uh, one that hasn't been mentioned, Stubby Clap. And the reason should be obvious if you saw Stubby Clap take down Pete Alonzo. <laughs> uh, I think it was Pete, right? It was Alonzo that he took down. Yep. Yeah. If you yep. saw He's that been happen, mad about you know it too. You, want, <laughs> you want little tiny Stubby uh, on on your team to go and rescue the Red Baron. So there you go, uh, A. Schaefer. I'm sure you listen to the pod. So those are the guys that are coming for you and uh, stay safe up there in Russia and your Arctic prison, but we're sending the crew here soon. Don't worry. All right. Uh, back to Cardinals related questions. Actually, I got so caught up in that question that I forgot to look at what I was going to ask next. Oh, I've got to <laughs> ask this one because, because John is, is here. So this is from a uh, lose rain hat. Uh, a question for uh, John <laughs> LaRue. Uh, what does the Cardinals base runnings record tell us about the 2023 season? Or how much do you think sequencing was responsible? Now that's a that's an old JL cut, so uh, you'll have to explain again what base runs are because I forgot since you left the site. So, yeah, I think it's. I mean, so I think even like my first article maybe I wrote was about the base runs thing, but it, it's um, basically base runs are singles, doubles, triples, home runs, etc. Have the, um, a certain run value, and so it's what you do with this with with teams. You strip it out of context, so. I might go three for 27, but if I get three singles in a row, I, I'll get a run and win one to nothing. But, you know, it, if you actually do the base runs on that, three singles aren't really worth that much, really. Um, it played a part last year. I mean, I don't think it was, this wasn't some magical elixir where they would have been a playoff team with better sequencing luck or anything. But um, I took a look through July 31st when the season actually ended. And I mean, they were like five runs worse or five wins, I'm sorry, five wins worse. So, um, you know, I mean, they were still an under 500 team, but it was more like a 78 win team instead of the 71 win team that they ended up being. So definitely a good question though. I mean, they, anything that could have gone wrong for that team last year really did. Yeah. And including sequencing, but not limited to sequencing. Sequencing, defense, uh, all kinds of things come together. What yep. would you, what would either of you can answer this? Um, what would you have said? I know we've heard from all of our writers, what was the true talent level of that team? Like I, I thought going in, there were a 93 win team that fell apart real fast. Um, but looking back on it, where would you have landed as their true talent, their baseline for that season where they should have been? Hey, 
okay, this is going to sound like a cop out. It's like 85, but I think there's such a huge error bar and there was probably a, a bigger error bar for them because they, with the shift going away and they had so much pitch to contact and before they could paper over some of that stuff with shifts. Um, it, and it really was like anything that could go wrong did. And so that they just hit the bottom of that error bar. Yeah. Um, whereas the year before it was kind of the opposite where you had like Albert Pujols suddenly becoming vintage Albert Pujols. I mean, how many more wins is that worth? Right. Or um, Adam Wainwright at age with 39 the year before pitching like he did when he was 29. And then this year he pitched like he did, like a 40 year old. I mean, it, you know, um, I do. I really do think they were good enough to contend for sure. Just anything that could have gone wrong did. True talent would have been 85. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I, I think that sounds about right. If I, I want to say Dane Perry wrote in his Substack that if you look at their uh, Woba compared to their ex Woba, they were the unluckiest team in the in the National League. And if you also think about the fact that you know they pretty much sold at the deadline, so they weren't even really trying to win for the last two months of the season. Uh, Eighty five wins sounds about right. Okay. Two Cardinals questions uh, that we uh, that we had here. Let's jump to something fun and let's open this up to to everybody here. Um, we'll we'll kind of I'll, I'll throw this out there and I'll just let you make a choice now. If you don't watch the show or you didn't watch the show, then then you can defer. But Redbird sixteen asks your all time veb writers as the cast of The Office. And so you're going to have to be an office fan to be able to answer this. Anyone, anyone among us not know the office Heather's giving yeah, me that. I, look. I would, I I'm almost now I'm, I think I'm going to, people are going to stop. Some people are going to stop paying attention to me and immediately conclude they can never be friends with me again or want to talk to me because I've never seen a single episode of the office. Before. You've never seen a single episode of the office. Not no. even on comedy central on accident. <laughs> never wow. seen it. Right. I'll we'll cut to the accident thing. I've seen bits and pieces, but uh, that's mostly my experience with The Office is watching it by accident. But it's still it's still good. <laughs> it's still but, enjoyable that way. Yeah. So those of you that have uh, actually watched TV over the last twenty years and know what's <laughs> good, uh, <laughs> uh, maybe that's just me and maybe Alex. He's 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 been smiling. He hasn't. He has I was more than an accidental watcher, but I was less than a super fan. I yeah. was probably around 2005, 2006, a very loyal Office watcher, and then sort of fell off um, post um, Rashida Jones. I would say whenever uh, so pretty yeah. early, pretty early. Yeah. So I, I didn't make it through the whole run. So. I'm not going to be very good at this question either. But <laughs> All right. So maybe I should have vetted this. Gabe, did you watch The Office? Are you a fan? I mean, I, I did. Uh, I, I know didn't... enough to answer the question. Same. I should know enough to answer the question, but I I, I don't know if I can. So That's the thing. Uh, I'm like is that this... big of an Office fan. Is this going to hurt people's feelings? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Think... <laughs> I'm not like, insulting I... the show. I do. <laughs> Yeah, you can't hurt mine because I wouldn't get the reference. So yeah. <laughs> there you go, guys. Viva Alberto's way too busy <laughs> writing and and talking about stats to ever watch things like The Office. So Heather, you're the only one that can answer the question. One VEB writer that is a Office uh, character. Give us one, one. VEB writer. Um, it's it's. <laughs> I was gonna say it's me and it's Michael Scott. No, <laughs> <laughs> that feels appropriate, but um, no, let's see. Oh, oh no. Um, it, it would be nice to pick someone that is on right now. Oh, I thought of a mean one for Michael Scott, so I'm not going to say it, but you guys might be able to guess. Don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, now everyone's wondering <laughs> i don't think people watch the office are wondering i'll be honest yeah um, i i got nothing i can't yeah. think of anything well how about we just say how about we just say this this will end it heather has been and always will be our Pam. How about that? Oh, <laughs> I do like Pam. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We can move on. Okay. So Yay. I really wanted to get to this question. This is from Book Al. And some of you will know who Book Al is from, 
from Twitter. Uh, and, and this is for both John and Alex, uh, who I guess, you know, have occasionally broken bread together in the DC area. So this might be right up your alley. Uh, this says, John, you are a master barbecue griller slash smoker. If you and Alex were to team up on a barbecue grilled smoke <laughs> dish that was somehow Cardinals theme, what would it be? And actually, before we ask this, I, I'm curious how many of us have written food related articles at, at VVLB at, at some point in time, because I'm a yes. John, you're I know you're a yes. I think I have. Yeah. yeah. I think I did. Alex, did you ever go down the food, the food path there? I'm trying to think. Um, so the closest I ever did to that is I looked at very old and bad commercials that Cardinals start in. Um, you know, some <laughs> some were local affiliate yeah. commercials, some were more national brand commercials, and a few of them were food related. But that's I think as close as I ever got. Yeah, yeah. Gabe, have you ever done a food article? I don't believe I have. Really, a drinks article? Nothing. Yeah, no, it doesn't sound on brand for me not to have had a drinks article, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That's the rest of your spring training or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so you guys are smoking and grilling. What what are you guys making? What are you, what are you serving the rest of the VEB chat? Well, we're both DC guys, right? So I think there's like a half on the side. You got to have the Ben's Chili Bowl or maybe a half smoke or something. I don't know. But Alex, I'll let you. You actually live in DC proper, so. Um, but I've actually made toasted ravioli in the grill before, and I, I feel like that's St. Louis enough to qualify, I hope, at least. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I saw this question in advance, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you smoked a duck not that long ago, and it looked incredible. <laughs> and so I was trying to think of a cardinal that was somehow duck adjacent. <laughs> I think, um, but I couldn't think of like someone who walked like a duck or had a name that almost had duck in it, but I couldn't think of anyone. Um, so I'm going to piggyback off John and just because he's the grill master, he's the, he's the one who's the expert at the barbecue and I'm just going to eat whatever he cooks because I <laughs> trust him. I think if we go that route, you take one of the miniature ice cream helmets, put it on the bird and call it Fredbird. <laughs> I'm not wrong about that duck, right? Didn't I yeah, see no, that? you nailed it. Yeah, okay. yeah, looks so good. <laughs> yep, looks so I, good. Must have looked good if you remembered it. So, <laughs> it did. Yeah. All right, we've got time for um, maybe one or two more questions. So let's just kind of um, go down this route. Um, London Bird asks, "What are your favorite VEB stories uh, or legends?" And I'll let anyone answer this one. I definitely want to see Alex and John give their answers, but but current current writers too can weigh in here. Your your favorite <laughs> VEB stories and legends. And I'll let you think about it for a second because that some of you yeah, might not have even seen it. So Gabe, go ahead. Um, uh, I think we could say this more. I don't know what the uh, Dick Dick and a toaster. That's the best story. He used as an analogy for why you can't keep doing stupid things. Like if you put it in the toaster and you happen to meet a hot paramedic and then you hit it off, that doesn't mean you can keep, you, you should follow that rule to hope it happens to you. That's, <laughs> was, a that a was that a red one? baron? Was that a red baron? Yes, was, yes, okay, I thought so. Yeah. It, yeah. it yes. reads as one. Yeah. And that's why he's stuck in an Arctic prison folks right there. <laughs> well, I was thinking about the office question because I'm not satisfied with not having an answer. Um, I was thinking Creed um, is the Red Baron because he seems the most likely to be stuck in an Arctic prison <laughs> <laughs> of the office characters. Yeah. And if you um, got some favorites or some favorite articles too, the things that you wrote or things you read that you just, you can't get out of your mind for VEB. So not long after I started at VEB, and I should preface this by saying that one of the kind of mistakes I made going into VEB is I had been reading VEB for a while, but I never looked at the comments. I, I wasn't a lurker. I never commented. And to, to not know kind of the environment and the people who are frequently commenting is almost not to know VEB at all. Yeah. Um, and one day, Craig Edwards you all know how it works. He just said, Hey, can someone, you all remember when this was a thing, can someone, will you please write up Matt holiday uh, as a first baseman and whether or not that will work. Um, and he asked me to do that. And I was like, sure. Um, and so I write 
900 words about should Matt Holiday be a first baseman? This was like 2016 or so. Having no idea that this has been something that has been discussed ad nauseum in the comments. <laughs> or, it, it was like, it'd been like if I'd walked into like a JFK conspiracy group that had been <laughs> active for 20 years and said, like, have you guys heard about this grassy knoll? You know, you know, like something like that. Um, everyone in the comments was just like, have you not been here? You, you know, everyone <laughs> was just like roasting me in a very kind way, but letting me know. You're oh, they were kind zero. back then. Okay. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're breaking zero ground here. I, 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 I'm being kind by saying they were being yeah, kind. Sure. Not yeah, sure. <laughs> be clear. Um, but that was, uh, it, it almost felt like an initiation. Yeah. yeah. I think everyone has one of those moments. <laughs> Where you're, you're, everyone has their own personal Matt Holiday at first base moment. Yep. Yep. I think one of my favorite articles is one Dan Moore wrote uh, about the 10 mil millionaires club. Um, I think Dan also wrote one. I, I just like a lot of stuff he writes because it's like the fan fiction -y kind of stuff. Um, but the 10 millionaires club is um, I was Matt, Matt, Matt Holiday signing uh, his big ex contract, I guess, or extension. I can't remember what the technical thing was. And then they go into the 10 millionaires club and uh, the Yankees all scoot on their uh their segways and like circle around them and there's kyle loesch getting an orange slice in his orange slice <laughs> um another one i really liked is anyone can play second base um the um oh my gosh pa pa what is the guy's name paquette the paquette sequences oh yeah that's a good one um i'll have to find those and and send you guys some links <laughs> that's an old <laughs> one that's got to be old i mean that's you're really digging deep for paquette yeah those yeah. are some of my favorite ones um anyway someone else go <laughs> yeah. john oh uh, yeah i just uh basically it was when you pissed off harrison bader I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which was hilarious because it's like i see this article like this is really good stuff this is great and there was just some little turn of phrase in the headline that harrison bader caught wind of it and he's bad mouthing it I was like, what the hell? This, but it was a great article. It's, I think that that was the thing that cracked me up the most. But it was my first. I, I hope you don't mind me taking joy in your pain. Oh but... no! I mean, I I was ecstatic. <laughs> Here was a brand new writer, first article, and Harrison Bader quotes it. It was my first and last creative headline. I I, I stopped from there on. <laughs> the headline was, "Is Harrison Bader broken?" That's that was the question. It was a it was a play on words because of his struggles with breaking balls. I can't even. I guess it must have been the 2019 season. That's when I came on. Was right after the season in 2019 and yeah, he found it. And, uh, and I can't remember exactly what he said, but, um, but he said essentially throwing that one in the digital trash can and getting back to work is what he said. I'm like, the whole point of the article is that you just have to work on hitting breaking balls and you'll, you'll be fine, man. But you know, <laughs> that's neither, very neither did he read well. the article, nor did he bother like responding to me on Twitter. Not that I like, you know, went at him or anything, but, but I was like, I could, I could defend myself, and no, no, no interest in that at all. So, <laughs> uh, any more, uh, uh, Gabe, Mike, you guys got anything? I think for me, um, you know, one of the really interesting things about you know getting involved in groups like this, having these kind of discussions, and um, all the different writers is, you know, I've just encountered a, a lot of people who do things really well that I don't know how to do. And one of the, I think one of the, it's not so much, well, one of the things I really enjoyed, I think John had done some articles. I'm really into the historical stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, all those, you know, trying to understand the differences between, you know, how the game might've been played, how people viewed what was important to roster and things like that. And so I really enjoyed, you know, John's, uh, he did some off season outlooks on some older seasons that I remember I enjoyed those. That's sort of the kind of thing I might do. Um, but, uh, one of the former recappers and frequent commenters, just the, the treats on a daily basis with all the gifts that J dog would do. J dog 55. That's a good one. Yeah. And that for me, because, you know, cause he would, it, it, you know, it's, it, it, there was just so many times when, you know, and I would, I would write an article and he'd be one of the responders that, you know, had, would, would talk, would have a gif and it was like skies transact. It was just, it was just a really cool guy. I mean, I can only imagine, you know him being just a, like an one of the, he's one of those awesome cool dads you know what i mean you can picture him you know he's got 
I mean, he's just, that was just a, a real treat because he, he just really had his own style with the way he did those, you know, recaps and just plus just the, the daily um, amount of joy that I would get from him. Mm -hmm. I think he's watched everything ever because he always has like a thing <laughs> yeah. um, referencing something I'm like I don't know what this is but this is funny yeah. <laughs> yeah. there was a good one today I can't repeat it on air uh, because then we'd have to change our uh, our rating <laughs> to to E for explicit but uh, there <laughs> there was a good one today for those who haven't seen it on this post for uh, for the Q&A section uh, a good one that he posted today for that so it's worth checking out okay I have I have got one question I have to ask and then one that I want to to kind of uh, bring this to to a close here, uh, the, obviously these are for our guests, for for Alex and for for John. The first one is this: um, How do you guys see the twenty twenty four season going for the Cardinals in relation to the division? And Alex, I'll start with you. You got the Cardinals. You got someone else. Where where do you think this is going to head for them? I think I am still spooked by last season, and I hate to say it, but I am going to pick the Cubs to win the division Ooh. with uh, about 88 wins, and the Cardinals come in around 85 or 86. Brave. Brave. It's a good thing you don't write there anymore, otherwise they're going to... I hope I'm... <laughs> as you all know, I hope I am so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. John, what do you think, man? Same, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I think they're right there, but um, they're they're right there. Is like again, it's like the two nerds fighting in a high school parking lot. Who's going <laughs> to emerge victorious? Does anybody? <laughs> care? Um, like, yeah, I think the Cubs may be a little bit a little bit better right now. It's again big error bars too, though. I mean, it wouldn't shock me to see the Cardinals win ninety or not more than that, but. Um, or the Cubs winning 75 or something, but I think more than likely it's like the Cubs by a couple of games. The Bellinger signing probably leaned a little bit more in that direction, yeah. Yeah, that and Imanaga. Um, there will probably be some mysterious like three week span where the Reds or Pirates get hot and we're like, wow, maybe they're for real, and that won't ever happen, but yeah. All right, last question for you two. You get you get basically one word answer. Uh, you can give an explanation if you feel like you need to. I don't know how long this this one goes back, but um, I have been convinced to ask every one of our guests, and sometimes I even remember to do it. Uh, this started uh, with me asking guests with Victor Scott, who gave us an excellent answer. So I'm asking you guys as well. Is a hot dog a sandwich? No. No. John says no. Alex. Jason, you actually froze on my end. Can you say that again? Is a hot dog a sandwich? No. No. Two no's. I think I, I can't I can't remember whether Victor Scott was a yes or no. I think he might have been a yes. So the no's have it for now. Did we ask Dane? I think we forgot to ask Dane. The tweet him. Yeah, we'll have to go back and we'll have to go back and get Dane's answer to that. So anyway, guys, our first VEB podcast uh, alumni episode is in the Bucks. John LaRue, Alex Crisofuli. It's great to see you guys again. And we see you guys out there on Twitter all the time. And and Alex, you do a lot of podcasts. And John, you've been on with us. We'll probably have you every year, man, because you're just you're just I'm never going to let you go. Uh, there's a song about that. <laughs> but uh <laughs> But thanks for having us, and uh, thanks for Heather and Gabe and, and Skyrick as well for joining and weighing in. Our next episode will be in two weeks where Adam and Blake will be back along with Gabe, and we're going to do some minor league stuff talking about the uh, Viva Alberto's top prospect list uh, that Gabe has been compiling and all of you have been voting on. So that will be here in a couple weeks, and then the season will start, and who knows what will happen. Apparently the Cubs will be good. I'm going to hold Alex and jail to that one but for heather and alex and john and gabe and mike uh, we will see you around the site have a very happy saturday we'll see you soon <laughs>